It was a cold, snowy evening in January of 1913 when several of the boys approached a then 24-year-old Murray McMurray at the local library and asked Murray to serve as scoutmaster. Happily, his answer was yes. Murray was preparing for his wedding at that time and knew he would be staying in Webster City, which made his decision easy. Thus, a nearly 60-year-long relationship began. The era of the McMurray Scout Troop began officially on January 29, 1913, when 18 boys joined their new scoutmaster for the first meeting. They met initially at City Hall, but quickly transitioned to the attic gymnasium of the South School building, where they met Wednesday evenings for about an hour. They first took care of troop business, including reciting the Pledge of Allegiance and the Scout Oath, before moving to other business. The weekly meetings were for scouts only, except for one open meeting each fall, to which were invited relatives and friends who were interested in the boys' activities. Guests also observed, for example, the natural history collections and artwork made by the scouts. And if these and other planned activities didn't keep the boys busy, one of the many bats that called the attic home was likely to make an appearance and the chase was on. In addition to the Wednesday night meetings, the boys met weekly to complete a tramp through the woods, or hike in today's vernacular. They took a two-hour tramp, one of their first, along Brewers Creek in early February of 1913, just days after McMurray took the helm. It said the weather was balmy that day. And on those particularly cold winter hikes, the boys might strap on their ice skates for a brisk hike on the frozen creek or the river. It is interesting to note that the boys were tested by completing a half mile hike in 25 minutes, a requirement to move up in rank. But here's the deal. The boys had to find and follow a specific but unknown trail. Each boy was given several numbers. Boxes were placed along the trail that had been marked with corn by the scoutmaster the day before the test. Each time a scout found a box, he dropped one of his numbers in. In order to pass, the scout had to put his number in at least four of the boxes and arrive at the end of the trail within 25 minutes. This was not an easy task, especially since the trail had seasoned for 24 hours before the test began. The tramps sometimes became a competition. For example, on one hike, half the boys were the Wind River Horse Thieves, and the other half were the cowboys of the Flying Flapjack Ranch. Several stray horses from the ranch, so designated by handkerchief flags, were dispersed along the trail. The contest was on when the thieves attempted to corral the horses, that is, steal the flags and take them over the border while the cowboys worked to bring the horses home. And in case you're interested, the thieves won this particular contest. Throughout the year, the boys also would get involved in special projects. One such project in 1917 involved the making of ration heaters for soldiers at the front in World War I. The boys were not required to have a scout uniform, but were encouraged to do so. The fellows were prompted to earn their own money needed for a uniform, which cost $2.75 in 1913, and consisted of a coat, pants, leggings, hat, and knapsack. The uniform was generally used only for special occasions, family night at South Building and at camp, or when marching in parades. The scouts regularly marched in the Decoration Day Parade, which took place from 1868 until 1970 on May 30th, regardless of the day of the week. The boys took flowers to the local cemetery at the end of the parade and placed them on the graves of Civil War veterans. 
Eventually, flowers were placed on the graves of veterans of all our different wars. World War I, World War II, of course, but others as well. Competition was the order of the day for the McMurray Scout Troop. The boys took part in a variety of contests throughout the year. Records were kept, winners' names were printed on poster boards that were duly hung in the Scout Hall, and points were assigned with 10 points going to the first place winner, down to one point for the 10th place winner. The top seven, later the top 10 point winners, were treated to a week at the McMurray Cabin on Clear Lake, a much sought after prize. At the lake, fishing was the primary activity, followed closely by swimming or a game of roof ball. As for contests, the boys competed annually in a water boiling contest. Each boy was given just two matches. He had to locate his own fire making materials and use the matches to start a fire. Once the fire was going, he had to balance a coffee can filled with two quarts of soapy water over the fire and boil it over the top. The scout who succeeded in boiling his water in the shortest amount of time was rewarded with the trophy, a short length of a two by four with a tin can nailed to one end. Spring is extremely windy in Iowa. The scoutmaster would designate a Saturday in the spring for the annual kite flying contest. For this contest, each boy had to design and build his kite and was judged on the creativity of his design, how pretty it was, and, of course, whether his kite was airworthy, that is, the way the kite went up and the steadiness of the kite's flight once up. This event was a collaborative affair, often with a parent holding the kite's anchor while the scout went running into the empty field trying to find the updraft that would take his kite skyward. Sadly, many kites were lost to the wind due to the string breaking or the kite shredding when the string was strong, but the kite wasn't. Other contests were offered each year, bicycle racing, natural history contests in both the spring and the fall, track and field events, and artwork and creative events. Summer camp was always a highlight of the scout year. The boys did much of the work themselves, but they also had a chef along to do the cooking. It is interesting to note that for a three-day camp in 1913, groceries included one case of eggs, 50 loaves of bread, two gallons of tomato soup, 20 cans of condensed milk, two sides of bacon, 12 boxes of Unita biscuits, 15 pounds of butter, two bushels of potatoes, six boxes of cocoa, 20 pounds of sugar, and fresh meat as needed. The order of the chow line was determined by whose metal dinner plate sailed the farthest into a nearby field in a frisbee-like contest. It's quite doubtful that these plates were washed before the meal. Competition was the order of the day at camp, every day. Tent and later cabin inspection was always the first order of business. After that, the fellas played hard at track and field events, treasure hunts, volleyball games, baseball games, natural history hunts, follow the leader hikes, and virtually any other activity dreamed up by the scoutmaster and his assistants. Of course, there was always a little time for a swim in the creek, the only bath the boys had during the week. Each day ended with a large campfire. The boys sat around the fire and Murray recounted the day's activities, identified the winners of the contests, points earned, and previewed the next day's activities. And as the campfire burned low, Murray would launch into a story meant to give everyone a bit of a scare as they listened to the night sounds. Family and friends of the scouts were invited to spend one evening at the camp. The visitors would view the boys' sleeping quarters and the cook's tent and enjoy a picnic. The end of the day found the folks watching five-minute long skits put on by the boys. 
Over the years, the skits were characterized as everything from perfectly awful to creative and funny. Over the years, more than 1,300 boys were part of the McMurray Scout Troop at one time or another. Virtually every one of them talks fondly of the years they spent in the Scouts. Give any one of them an opportunity and they'll treat you to as many memories as you have time to hear. And of these boys, at least 207, perhaps more, served in World War II alone. Many others served in World War I, Korea, or Vietnam. For any who question the value of scouting, consider comments made in the February 20th, 1914 edition of the Webster City Tribune, which stated, mothers of the boys noticed many changes in their sons who were more useful in the home duties. The public school teachers also spoke of the new change in the scouts better attitude toward their work, and better discipline. And one scout in 1914 summed up this way, I am glad that our report does not deal in dollars and cents, but in lives made richer and better, with love of home and country, of brother scouts the world over, of school and church, and of God's green earth where the feathered brothers are calling us from the treetops and where the things of nature beckon us from our city life. I'm Jennifer McCullough. I'm the daughter of an Eagle Scout and the sister of an Eagle Scout, both of whom earned their wings in the McMurray Scout Troop. Even I have fond memories of getting to go to the attic for the family night open meetings and attending the family day at Dolliver Park, where summer camp was held beginning in 1924. I was also on hand to cheer for the guys at the sliding and kite flying contests. And perhaps best of all were the family outings in the spring and fall during the nature contests when we all pitched in to search for Dutchman's britches, bloodroot, snake grass, pussy willow, cattails, viceroy butterflies, cabbage moths, and so many other items found in nature. For those of you who were a part of the McMurray Troop, I have no doubt that you also have great memories of this unique experience. And so I issue you a challenge. Please post at Growing Up Webster City your favorite memories or perhaps your recollections of the troop's chosen song, the scout oath, the scout yell, or lyrics to camp songs such as Steamboat Bill or Casey Jones. Thanks for stopping by. <laughs>